Emma, they're here. With whom will you dance? Mother, you must sample the tart. <laughs> I thought maybe we could start just by talking about Emma. Like, how did you sort of envision Emma, the character? Like, how did you take her from page to screen and work with Autumn to sort of put her together? I started by reading the novel and reading the script and talking to Autumn and discovering the story that she wanted to tell. And what was clear is that uh, Autumn loves clothes. She loves clothes, she loves fashion, she loves fabric, she loves color. In talking to her, I knew exactly what she wanted because this period is really, really interesting because it was the beginning of women's fashion journals. And also it's not so far back in in history that the museums don't have original pieces of clothing. So the combination is, it's the first time you really get that um, combination of being able to see what the fashion plates and the fashion communication was for the period and put it next to the reality. It's a bit like us looking at copies of Vogue and then um, going into somebody's wardrobe and seeing what it really was. And what struck me about that research is that the the fashion plates are are fabulous, but um, the way they were done, they were engravings that were hand colored and you, come, you can come across the same engraving, which has been colored five different ways, which I love because it's a bit like kind of, you know, a coloring book and how to sell the image. But then when you start to look at the clothes, you really understood that number one, they are all hand stitched. Mostly the women were making their own clothes, doing their own embroidery, their own white work. Not the case for Emma because she was privileged and, and would use a seamstress. Um, and far too busy to spend her time sewing. I think the amount of clothes she has, she'd just be sewing for the whole film. And I suspect she's probably not that good at sewing, actually. <laughs> um, but it was just really interesting to see the, that to really understand that most of the fabrics were very, very lightweight, that the clothes were really put together in quite a spontaneous way. They didn't have machines, so nothing was overlocked or, or turned or bagged out. It's just whip stitched on the back. Quite often they were pieces from an earlier period that had been adapted to suit the fashion. So you really understood, you know, that, that it's not costume, it's clothes. And I, I came away from my research feeling that you could have shown the same fashion plate to 10 different women in a village or in a town, and you'd come out with 10 very different pieces of clothing because it depended on your money, your taste, your style and your ability to sew um, and your your style, your kind of flourish with detail. It was all about trims and detail and, and flounces. So it's the clothes are very personal. And within that world, I thought, how do we make Emma look like the kind of the queen bee, the big fish in the small pond? And because the story takes place over a whole calendar year, I thought the way to do it would be to give Emma a, a a complete working wardrobe for the year, but to be able to use that wardrobe so that she has the right piece of clothing for every time of the year, time of the day, occasion, and what she wants to say about herself. So rather than that just being an endless costume after costume after costume, I gave her a seasonal palette for each season so that she dictated the change of season and as she dictates a lot. And and then within that, It's a very, I think people quite often think of this period as just being, you know, a dress, you put on a dress and that's it. But actually the dress is built up of so many layers. So um, actually Emma only has three muslin dresses throughout the entire film, but they manage to look, I mean, make them look very different by the different colored petticoats underneath, the different little kind of infills and chemisettes, the different collars, the gloves, the jewelry, the bonnet, the spencers, the pelises the boots, the shoes, you know, you can make it very different. And so what was interesting is that, you know, when you're filming, usually you get the actors ready to a certain kind of base level of corsets and petticoats and the dresses are being prepped. And then the actors go and rehearse. And then when Anya came back, I could talk to her about the scene and, and how she felt what she wanted to show in the scene. And so we could kind of dress into that or out of that. And we could kind of put together the finishing touches to to really kind of point the costume for for the way the scene was playing so it was it was quite organic it was very busy um but that's how we worked it and and autumn's the way autumn wanted 
the film to work is that she wanted the humor to come out of the reality of the situation. So rather than imposing humor, she wanted to know and understand all about the etiquette, the social structure, the hierarchy, the fashion, the clothes, everything about the period so that she could draw the humor out of that. So it was a big, it was a very collaborative experience and that um, worked across, you know, I worked with Cave, uh, with the colors that she was using in the interiors. I worked with Maurice um, for the hair and the hairstyles because obviously that's all got to balance and work with the headdresses and the bonnets and, you know, so, but again, you know, it was fun because there were no stunt doubles, there were no repeats. So everything was a one-off and it, it really was like dressing for Emma. It was like dressing for the moment, dressing for the day. <laughs> What was the process of getting those hats made? Did you have a milliner you were working with or anything like that? Mm, several, because there are a lot. There are a lot of hats. I can remember very clearly quite early on um, in the fitting process, I was already starting with the clothes with Anya, but we I knew that we we had a, a huge amount of hats and bonnets and, and things to work out. So we were fitting in conjunction with the clothes. Again, the advantage of this period is that you can hire existing stock from the costume houses. So you have pieces that you can try on. And I find that invaluable because it's, it means you're open to the lucky accident. You put something on that you didn't expect to work and you go, oh, that's interesting. And I can take from that. And very quickly, you know, the shapes that don't work. So we just had a, a Saturday morning where we sat and we tried on different hats and we just looked at them. And, um, and once you get into that process, it's very clear what works and what doesn't work. Again, then working with Maurice about how the hair would work for each shape. And then knowing how far you can push the lines and the balance um, and the colors and the feathers, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. How did you define the friendship between the two young ladies? I think it's a very contemporary, every age story. It's about two girls who are best friends and they have different assets and different characters and different qualities. And it's that kind of, that interplay between the two of them. Obviously at the beginning, Emma has the upper hand and she takes Harriet as a kind of an occupational toy, you know, something that she's going to fill her time with. But Harriet grows and she finds her way. So I used color and silhouette to kind of try and shadow their story and who was holding the power, who was confident. You know, it's just a kind of, it's a story about two young women and the interplay between them. It was great because uh, Anya and Mia uh, know each other very well. So there was a, a very kind of good relationship and a rapport between the two of them that that I could feed off. You could sort of see um, Harriet getting a little more confident fashion-wise and a little more like, well, if I buy this ribbon, I can use it, you know what I mean? Like over the course of the movie. Yeah, and she's kind of indulged by, you know, she she shadows Emma to begin with. And I I know it's kind of academic research that doesn't come across to the viewer, but I think I think everything sort of adds up to information. You know, she's wearing a bonnet that is a bit backdated that maybe Emma's had for a few years. And she said, oh, you can have this one knowing that she's wearing the, the best one because she's wearing the latest fashion. And Harriet's trimmings are always a little bit more mundane. You know, when she's in the haberdashers, she's, she's debating over ribbons and doesn't have that confidence. So I just wanted to bring all that, all that into it. And then there's a kind of, you know, as Harriet's confidence grows, then her, her dresses are becoming a little bit more sophisticated, but she still doesn't have Emma's money. But she's beginning to find her own style and kind of um, just challenges Emma in her independence of style a little bit. I think the portrait when Emma dresses her up is a kind of turning point for her. How did you sort of define Knightley and um, Frank Rachel? You know, how did you define them as individuals? You know, it's in the script and it's in the novel, but also, you know, actors bring their own presence and mm -hmm. they bring their thoughts and we work together and and their different physicalities and proportions and coloring. So, so you're working with the actor and you're working with the character. Johnny is Knightley, you know, he's, he's part of the, the landed gentry. Uh, he has uh, a very kind of discreet, refined taste and style. 
but a kind of practicality. You know, he always walks over to Emma's house. He doesn't ride, he doesn't take his carriage, so he's quite modest. Frank Churchill is a bit flashier. He's a bit more full of himself, but he's also covering his tracks. So the whole story of he goes to London for a haircut, everybody's prepared to believe that. But actually, you know, he was using that as a cover. So so he's a player, you know, and I just wanted to bring that 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 spirit at the beginning of the movie there's a a scene where johnny (laughs) where knightley is getting dressed and you also sort of see like how that whole process came together like how they got dressed at the time yeah and that that came from autumn you know again you know she was talking she wanted to know what people's days were you know what what it was for a gentleman or for a farmer or for a squire and i was explaining it to her and she said she said i want to see that i want to see it so we showed her with johnny we did a whole kind of dressing routine and she said I've never seen that before I want that in my film so so that's where it came from and I think it was great actually you know it's um it's a bit of a turn up you know we see endless scenes of women dressing don't we you did have to dress two weddings in the movie which is it's just a kind of a fun prospect the two weddings are very different I think you know the Emma's wedding is was actually quite challenging because of the nature of Emma you know it's a kind of it's an opportunity to do you know who he comes the bride and you know the the dress steals the moment and actually because of Emma's journey that she's been on I didn't I didn't want to do that it's like it's the it's the culmination of her story and I didn't want it to all be about the dress so I was trying to be balanced more minimal than you would expect but very stylish and I do actually, I have to say, I think the, the wedding bonnet that she's wearing is one of my favorite pieces in the film. I had a wonderful milliner at, at Cosprop who made this, and it's made from about four different pieces of vintage crin, which are kind of meshed together to look like they all belong. And it's just um, the shape and the proportion and the translucence of it and being able to dress in real flowers. It was just... Um, it was sort of like a halo, like a sort of an aura around her. And I, I, um, I think it's just an amazing piece of work. And then, she, you know, she's just wearing like a, a nice day hat. So it sort of shows... Yeah, her- I mean, it's a much more modest wedding. And she's, you know, that really this point of the story is that um, she's been living with Emma and her closest friend and companion is is leaving for a new life. So... Again, it's about it's about her status and and moving on, and um, I wanted it to be simple, relatively simple and appropriate appropriate to her. You know, weddings. I think we all have images of you know weddings being weddings. Then we had a very different custom to them. It wasn't all about you know the great big taffeta dress. It was it was a, a different event. It was much more about, about the wedding breakfast and. Mm-hmm and the the celebrations. And then Bill Nye, that I decided with him, you know, he's he's a fusser, he's a hypochondriac, but he's a very caring man. And against Emma, I wanted him to be incredibly stylish and sophisticated. So we decided to to play the opposite and to very much control the palette of his clothes so that everything is in kind of shades shades of oatmeal and gray, so that it's very, um, it's about silhouette and style. And he very much belongs at Hartfield, so that he's got all the colour of the the interiors around him. But he's sort of he's he's bedded in with his screens and his particular chair. <laughs> Mrs. Elton is certainly a character. Um, she is. <laughs> she's over the top, and although she claims not to be, what yeah. was fun about dressing her? Well, again, the, the counterpoint to Emma's fashion taste and style. She's competitive, and she's new money, and she's all about assertion. So. Um, she's avidly reading the fashion magazines and and not filtering what she reads. She's going for it at every stage. And again, you know, it was it's clear in the scene when she has tea with Emma. It's about, you know, I was talking about working with Cave on the the colours of the interiors of the room. You know, there's not just the play of how the colours relate to Emma as the kind of the pivotal character, but also who's at who's at ease and who's at odds in their environment. So I could I could use Kay's color palette to, again, to counterpoint the clothes and and what's happening. Here's some pictures of Emma sort of later in the movie. And you mentioned that she had seasons, but I'm wondering if there was sort of like a an arc to her, like once she sort of realizes she's in love with Knightley or whatever, like through her outfits changed, does she get more subdued? 
um, or am I reading? Um, they get a they do get a little bit calmer when you're doing period films. You, there's so much energy that goes into the interiors and conjuring the magic in the period. And quite often for the exteriors, it um, the moment you have green grass, you sort of lose the period and it goes very <laughs> modern and suburban or whatever. But Autumn chose um, incredible landscapes and countryside. And and it, the the we had amazing skies, we had wind, we had all that long grass with movement. So I really wanted to, to try and make Emma work in her environment, you know, even when she's walking um, up with the goose to, to apologize. Obviously I wanted her to be more demure there, but certainly in the, the sequence on the left with the, the dress with the green, I knew that um, that was going to happen under the tree and there was this incredible sky and the wind and just the, the interplay of greens and, and making Emma feel like a sort of small piece of calm in this quite tempestuous um, landscape. And of course, that's the scene where she has the nosebleed. So, which was interesting because <laughs> we did only have one dress. So normally when you have blood on set, you, you always have a backup just in case it goes very wrong. And uh, <laughs> I can remember saying to Johnny just before they started, they turned over, he had a handkerchief. I said, this is your handkerchief. Make sure you get it. <laughs> um, maybe this is a good part to talk about her jewelry. Like, were these period pieces? Were these your creations? I noticed. No, uh, well, obviously we don't have a lot have of the, coral. <laughs> no, we don't have the budget to be buying authentic um, 19th <laughs> century. I do research a period very, very uh, clearly when I'm starting work on a period piece because I, I need to know and understand the style of the period so that I can make choices to help tell the story. Um, and I think, no, I do um, a lot of markets, a lot of car boot sales, uh, antique dealers. You know, you just start to find an eye for what will work. Um, and, and again, you know, it's about looking at it in the fitting and seeing what, what works, what scale is right, what, what balance is right. Um, and you just find your way, you know, the, the cross that she's wearing is actually that piece we had made and it's taken from a cross that Jane Austen had that her brother gave her and it's topaz. That's based in, a, in Austen reality. I guess we should touch on a little Jane Fairfax, <laughs> Mrs. Bates. She's the woman of a certain age, I guess, of the era, like mm. she grows into being an older, an older woman. And then Jane, I guess, a little less wealthy, maybe, maybe. Uh... A little less wealthy, quite private. You know, she's covering her tracks, so a little bit more demure, wanting to kind of not take the headlight, really, other than when she plays the piano at the concert, which is amazing. You know, she's sort of holding herself back. She's she's covering um, mm -hmm. and doesn't want to draw attention too much. You know, she's not going to get drawn into the head-on competition of it all because she, she, she knows what's going on and doesn't want to blow her cover. And then by contrast, Mrs. Bates is like, she's a tall lady. She, is, she talks quite a lot. <laughs> There's just always a little bit too much of her. It's a little bit too busy. Her mother was uh, married to the vicar, widowed. So they're on, you know, their income is greatly reduced and they're, they're, she is trying very hard to to maintain her pride and her dignity in reduced circumstances. And I think that just makes her talk too much and be far too busy. Yeah. And it's just, you know, it's a limited wardrobe that she, you know, she always, most of the scenes other than summer, she has her coat, she's got her one coat and that's that's her coat and it's always there and the ties are a bit all over the place and, and her bonnet's not quite on straight and everything's just a little bit kind of, you know, not quite, sorted out you know you did a lot of servants you got these school girls like was mm -hmm. there you know I assume you did, I don't know if you made all those costumes um yeah but no, you, we did was, we did oh my goodness the thing that we you know it, it's interesting we did make them all partly because I was trying to control the palette mm -hmm. and my first film that I did was a Jane Austen in 95 I think which mm -hmm. makes me feel real but um I did manage to find one dress from that 
from that film. But because the clothes are so fragile, they don't, you know, by the time they've done a film, they don't sit well on hangers in storage, you know, they just don't <laughs> last. Um, and also the pastels are not, it's not my comfort zone working in pastels, but the more I got into it, the more I understood that I needed you know, very much the, the very particular shade of yellow to work with the particular shade of pink if I was going to do that. So, so the more you, you get into a period and the more you start trying to tell the story you want to tell, the more specific it all becomes. Um, the red capes are actually taken from, it's an amazing uh, little book of watercolors by a lady called Diana Sperling, who who lived in a, she was quite important in the village she lived in, and she did these really beautiful watercolors that are exactly of this period. And the red cape was the kind of the go-to practical um, outdoor garment. If you only had one, one warm outdoor layer, it would probably be your red cape. And she does all these really beautiful sort of naive, spirited watercolors of of life in the countryside and that's that's where the red capes came from you know i really love the the look of this movie and i, I love how it sort of works all together and i i hope no uh, no it was an autumn led a great collaboration and we had a lot of fun we worked really really hard but it was you know it was fun and it was collaborative and there was a there was a sense of everything adding up you know that we really it did and we had a great group of actors too. You know, they were very, they enjoyed the processes and and contributed and and brought. You know, it was great. It was good. Emma. 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 Um. Probably the second. 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 Probably the second.